My name is Olena Karbu, and on behalf of the Ukrainian think tank liaison office uh, in Brussels, I'm happy to welcome uh, you on our uh, common webinar on issues on issues of uh, fighting to Kremlin hybrid hybrid aggression, and I'm happy to uh, to. Uh, also to uh, introduce our co-organizers with whom we decided to do this webinar. And this is Text Org UA and Internews Ukraine. These are leading Ukrainian think, uh, Ukrainian think tanks dealing with the media, propaganda, disinformation. Our uh, partners from uh, Czech Republic, European Values Center for Security Policy, David and Veronica. And uh, of course, um, Ah, yes, and we do this webinar with the support of International Renaissance Foundation. And we gather together, this is our yet another uh, event uh, as an occasion to speak about important uh, issues, important for Ukraine and apparently important for the Central Europe and the European Union as such. And these recent developments, uh, particularly in the Czech Republic and uh, that Ukraine has been under the Russian um, attack, including in the media area for already for several years, gave us yet another reason to speak about how can we together counteract such activities? What can different stakeholders do, including civil society, expert community, authorities, media community, and all those who are interested and who want to protect their countries against such activities, such uh, aggressive activities. And uh, with this, I would like uh, first to give a floor to David Stulik from uh, European Value Center for Security Policy. And we want uh, uh, to ask him to put uh, this recent developments into the more into more general context and mm. to tell more the in the genesis and how we can prepare uh, ourselves better so david the floor is yours yeah. thank you thank you Olena, and uh, thank you everybody for organizing this important event uh, let me reveal some of the background of the preparations of this uh, online talk. We started to work on it more than months ago, and I was kind of puzzled what sort of content uh, we should focus on. But in the meantime, we found out that the Czech Republic uh, was also a subject to a Russian military aggression, uh, that uh, Russia military officers are behind those uh, explosions in uh, Czech uh, ammunition depot in Vrbětice, and now suddenly we have had quite a lot of things in common, unfortunately. And as a person who spent quite a long time in Ukraine, and I was there during those uh, crucial days back in 2013, 14, 15, uh, I think I, I'm now kind of in a privileged position to compare the experience of the Czech Republic and Ukraine. And let me start with saying the first, let's say, uh, assumption of first, let's say, thesis. Uh, you fully realize the impact uh, and uh, the nature of Russian hybrid operations only as long as you are directly targeted by them. Uh, now I think uh, many Czechs kind of realized what the Ukraine has been experiencing since 2014. Uh, before, quite a lot of Ukrainian friends of mine were asking me why uh, Europe is reacting, let's say, so uh, mildly uh, why Europeans do not understand what's uh, at the stake in Ukraine. And I think now many Czechs might have the similar feelings. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were the subject of a military attack uh, done by the, as I said, Russian intelligence officers on our territory. So it was a direct military attack on the EU and NATO member state. And this is very, very, I would say significant thing a uh, very serious thing. And I would say that for many Czechs, this could could be a kind of a, a mind changer uh, that uh, is kind of shaping their, let's say, perception of Russia quite completely. And I think that quite many Czechs uh, felt the same things like Ukrainians have felt during the last couple of years this Monday, when the high rep of the EU said that the EU is not willing to further escalate 
this rift and conflict with Russia that the EU is not going to continue that diplomatic war of, expul of expulsion of uh, Russian diplomats from other EU member states. Because here I would say for quite a significant part of the Czech society, uh, this is a kind of, a, it is perceived as a lack of uh, solidarity of the other EU member states. As you know, we were supported by three Baltic states. So we were supported by uh, Slovakia and Romania, uh, who also expelled a number of jo Russian, uh, Russian diplomats, but that's it. And uh, this is something that uh, Ukraine has been experiencing since 2014 quite often when uh, Ukrainians, both the, let's say, civic activists or the government were requesting a uh, more serious approach and more severe punishment of Russia for that ongoing uh, aggression, which in the Ukrainian case is both hybrid and kinetic. Right now, the Czech Republic and maybe also Bulgaria, as it seems also it's Bulgarian uh, reality, we were the subject uh, to, let's say, partial explosions and uh, following uh, hybrid operations, including disinformation and propaganda narratives and messaging. I'm, I'm very happy that we will have here Veronica, my colleague, who will present the uh, narrati uh, narratives that uh, Russian linked, uh, let's say, propagandists or disinformers have been using. And as you will see, they have very similar to the same to the to the ones that were or have been used and implemented also in Ukraine. So I would say that uh, the result of our, let's say, brainstorming when we were preparing this uh, seminar, which ended up in the title Brothers and Sisters in Arms, uh, shows quite a lot of things that we have in common. Unfortunately, Ukraine is not the NATO or EU member state, so Ukraine couldn't have counted on, on at least these, let's say, partial acts of solidarity that the Czech Republic experienced. But I think that uh, putting the overall mosaic about the Russian hybrid operations abroad, together with these small pieces, be the Ukrainian case, be it, uh, you know, the Czech, Georgian, Bulgarian cases, are altogether putting a kind of a broader perspective of what is happening. And it is disclosing a real nature of, uh, I don't want to say Russia, but at least of the Kremlin regime and of the Russian state. I still do believe that uh, we should distinguish between Russia, a Russian society, that despite the fact that they are very much uh, shaped by the state's Russian official propaganda and the Russian state on the other hand. But that's a topic for another discussion. So I will now just yeah, conclude here that indeed, uh, we are now kind of brothers and sisters in arms. And I hope that all together, we will be able to find responses to these uh, aggressive and assertive uh, uh, expressions of uh, hybrid operations of the Russian Federation. Thank you, David. Thank you again for stressing uh, that this unfortunate, we are fortunate to cooperate, to continue our cooperation, but this is for unfortunate reasons. Uh, we need to call ourselves uh, brothers and sisters in uh, arms. And this is another case for uh, to check also our uh, solidarity and our common action. And here we come to our uh, speakers and so we build our um, uh, discussion today to present uh, like uh, case studies of the countries uh, who have been under attack recently or not recently as in, in case of uh, Ukraine. And so we asked our speakers to say about what has been done? What what is what is going on? I mean, what is the amount? What is the level of attacks, including in the media area? And also, what is the response of each of the country has developed, and uh, what different stakeholders are doing, can do more. And then also the purpose of this exercise is that what can each of us can learn from each other. And given that Ukraine is under this attack for a longer period of time, we give first floor to our colleagues from Ukraine, Pro Petro and Volodymyr, to present uh, where Ukraine is now. And then 
we move to the Czech Republic, Veronica, and also hopefully she will uh, say also a couple of, because we know that your Kremlin watch is doing this monitoring and hopefully you will say a couple of words about the region of Central Europe, which David already started to touch. And then hopefully we will go to uh, Mrs. Ahonen uh, to give us overview of the EU respond uh, as a whole to uh, these recent developments, but also things which have been going on already for years. So uh, this is my pleasure now. And before I give the floor to the speakers, very technical uh, address again to our participants. Since we see you as active uh, parts of our today's event, please put your questions, comments uh, in the q and I'm asking you to do it in Q&A window, which you see in your screens. And then speakers will be able to see and I will be able to uh, speak loud your uh, questions. Please put them when the speakers are uh, speaking and then we will uh, answer your comments and questions in the end of the event. So this is it uh, from our side. Then I give the floor to Petro. Petro, the floor is yours, please. Uh, hello. First, I'd like to thank for the opportunity to speak about such an important issue. And I'd like to present our case. As uh, colleagues have stressed for a few times, Ukraine is under the constant attack, both military and informational. We in Texte monitor media environment regularly for the last two years. And uh, we look for the directions of most important information attacks and uh, narratives that Russian disinformation used to promote its policy and interests, both in Ukraine and neighboring countries. This spring, military tension on the border of Ukraine merged with informational operations. We've noticed that starting from the beginning of February, there was a growing number of materials about the escalation at the front line, shellings and similar uh, topics. Websites that were commonly spreading disinformation uh, on this issue were uh, constantly blaming Ukrainian armed forces in shelling and aggress aggressive actions against uh, civil uh, population, uh, while uh, Russian militants and mercenaries at the occupied parts of uh, eastern Ukraine were killing Ukrainian soldiers, uh, ignoring ceasefires that started uh, on um, July 2020. Uh, on uh, 90, uh, 80th, 20th March, Russian Defense Ministry website posted news about movements of huge por portions of Russian armed forces near Ukrainian border. Uh, they explained those movements by military exercises. However, the number of troops, uh, troops grew quickly and after the months, huge fraction of Russian army was locked either across Ukrainian border or in the occupied territories of Ukraine. Uh, as we know from both media, independent researchers and state actors, majority of those troops are still on their position, uh, as well as the military equipment they possess is ready to strike. Uh, what uh, could be the... Um, uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, those two facts are not disconnected. The informational campaign, in fact, started a uh, few weeks prior to the uh, first military tensions, and it supported it all around the way. What are the probable goals of these operations? Uh, we uh, figured out that those goals could be discredit Ukraine before international community cause panic among uh, civil uh, population of both uh, the gov governmentally controlled part of Ukraine and occupied part of Ukraine and promote Kremlin interest in the, in the region. The major narratives presented in this information about the concentration of troops is that the Russian army is preparing to defend against Ukraine offensive. We've noticed a variety of publications claiming that Ukraine is going to use force in order to deoccupy its territory. Sometimes disinformers use the example of Azerbaijan as a justification for Ukrainian alleged use of force. 
On the other hand, a lot of materials shared threats from Russian officials that Russian army will effectively destroy Ukraine and even could possibly strike in important administrative facilities uh, all around the country, including capital Kiev. In reality, Ukrainian political and military um, administration constantly stress that country is willing to deoccupy the territory only using political and diplomatic means. And it's even absurd to claim that Ukraine is going to attack Russia, which has one of the most powerful and well-funded militaries in the world. Uh, I would like also to mention some of the cover-ups that uh, propaganda, Russian propaganda uses in order to justify the Russian pressure, military pressure. They speak about, for example, Joseph Biden's words that Putin is a killer as a, a trigger. Also, they mention sanctions against Nord Stream um, gas pipeline and sanction against pro-Russian politicians in Ukraine and their media outlets. Recently, those politicians were accused uh, of treason uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and finally, I'd like to uh, say a few words about what was done and what could be done. In the last year, Ukraine limited a spread of Russian disinformation by imposing sanctions on TV channels controlled by those politicians I mentioned previously. Um, uh, which were uh, those politicians were accused of treason and the TV channels were possibly getting an indirect funding uh, from Russia. Also, the uh, governmental centers were created to tackle disinformation and civil uh, actors uh, were, uh, are constantly doing monitoring, fact-checking and research about the Russian propaganda and military operations, our organizations included. I believe that uh, the unity and support among the countries threatened by Russian aggressive policy, as well as a further international cooperation in this field could make um, uh, the fight against um, both uh, military uh, tension and uh, informational operations even more effective. And I hope that uh, this cooperation will increase among those uh, countries, uh, Ukraine and Czech Republic included, that were uh, actually uh, under attack, both in recent years and previously. Uh, I guess that's all I'd like to tell. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Petro, and thank you again for reminding us. It always uh, strikes me that uh, Russia is using new, new techniques, but so old narrative, accusing the victim in uh, aggressing the aggressor. So we have seen this so many times in the last century and unfortunately are still witnessing today. So, uh, Volodymyr, I give the floor to you to continue to tell us more about the Ukraine case. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thanks for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here in, the, in such a wonderful company. And I would like to follow up on something what uh, Petro was saying. Petro was uh, telling you the story about how Russia is basically attacking Ukraine militarily and supporting this uh, military threat with information threats. I would like to focus on internal Ukrainian internal agenda. And my short in, in, intervention will be divided in three parts. And in each of these parts, there will be three points. So it's it's very, you know, symmetric. I will talk about the challenge. I will talk about Ukrainian response. And I will try to talk about what to do. But I have only seven minutes, right? So the challenge. I think one of the key challenges of, of Russian hybrid threat is that it... Um, not only promotes the Russian narrative, the, the narrative of so-called Ruski Mir Russian world, but it enters the uh, the matrix, the um, the uh, the internal context of each given society: Czech Republic, France, EU, America, Ukraine as well, and it tries to kind of internalize. Uh, internalize its strategy into the minds of, of people themselves. You can call it, for example, reflexive control or something else. So what is Russia is doing? What, what are Medvedchuk TV channels are doing all the time? They're stressing on the weak points of Ukrainian society, for example, economic points, economic struggling, poverty, etc. And they're saying, look, this is because of the West. This is because of Ukraine's uh, EU integration, etc. Therefore, if you want to you know, uh, develop economic 
economically you need to renounce from the West. Therefore, at Internews Ukraine, we are focusing so much on this analyzing of the so-called, what we call anti-Western propaganda. This anti-Western propaganda, why we call it anti-Western propaganda by the pro-Kremlin TV channels, it's not because we, we believe in a kind of a consolidated West, but because they are using this term. They are using this term, you know, collective West, etc. Now, the second point, uh, because the, the, in the first point, you see, you know, such narratives as, for example, economic genocide. So they're using this term, very sensitive moral term, genocide, to uh, to uh, develop this story. Now, the second point is that Russia uh, information influences are not limited only to disinformation and fake news. It is naive to think that it's all about disinformation and fake. There are parts of the truth of what Russian, you know, vehicles, information vehicles are saying. I would call uh, I would call it more malinformation than disinformation. Malinformation meaning the mixture of lies and uh, half truth manipulations, you know, to promote uh, a certain narrative. For example, a narrative that going to the West means economic poverty, or uh, for example, democracy means war. And the third point of the challenge is that Ukrainian society is internally vulnerable to this. Uh, to these influences. It's not that it's not only that there is a malign uh, Kremlin, you know, operator who just manipulates, it's that Ukrainian society has internal weaknesses. And the key internal weaknesses is a kind of a lack of agency among Ukrainian people, among Ukrainian citizens. So Ukrainians, you know, are accustomed to believe that there is that the center of the decisions about their destiny lies outside the country, outside, somewhere outside. This creates lots of fertile grind for these conspiracy theories and for the so-called, the narrative, the key narrative of pro-Russian, uh, pro-Kremlin propaganda is about external governance by the West. Now, what was uh, the response of Ukraine? Uh, Petro already mentioned the sanctions against Medvedchuk linked TV channels, but what is, most important is what is going on right now is that uh, Mr. Medvedchuk uh, is facing an official legal suspicion and he's now uh, kind of wanted. He's, he, he's now, you know, there are rumors that uh, he is still in Ukraine, but he's not, uh, he's not arrested. And there are, you know, lots of stories whether he will let uh, travel to Russia or not because Mr. Kozak, his ally seems to be in Russia. So I think this is a kind of a harsh response by Ukrainian authorities, but with certain ambiguities. Uh, but it's important that it's taking place right now. The second issue that Petro also mentioned, the two centers that Ukraine already established after quite a few years, you know, the Center of Strategic Communications in the uh, Culture and Information Ministry and this anti-disinfo center in the National Security and Defense Council. So it's interesting to uh, see that there are two centers, not one. So how they will cooperate. And the key challenge, I think, is that uh, how the, the centers will coordinate among uh, various other branches of uh, you know, public authorities. This is very important. I would like to say that all Ukrainian NGOs who are involved in this uh, fight against disinformation are deeply working now with, with the centers, at least with the strategic uh, communication center because the head of the center comes from the civil society and it's very important. Now there is one in the response side there is one important weakness in the Ukrainian society it's basically non-preparedness to to escalation. Uh, even now we are talking about this non-preparedness and the I think the barometer of it was the that Ukraine uh, Ukraine uh, uh, key defense uh, production producer Ukrabronpron lacked for uh, several months lacked the so-called state procurement for its production and therefore it was a very tricky thing that the parliament was unable to to do this now what what can we do basically what can ukraine do i think uh, the first thing is that it is important to uh, to continue this kind of a hard line because even under poroshenko we ukraine lacked this hard line against medvedchuk and pro kremlin politicians and it is important to continue it and to uh, lead it to the end because there is lots of criticism that why there are sanctions, why there is no legal proceedings, why why there is no arrest, etc. So now 
yesterday we have this, you know, suspicion which can actually lead to to arrest. Uh, the strategy which is which is uh, selected by Ukrainian authorities is rather the strategy of follow the money approach and not, you know, banning TV channels because of their editorial policy. And I think this is a very important and very right approach. Uh, the second issue is that Ukraine should reconquer those topics on which pro Kremlin TV channels are very active. For example, the topics of economic struggle, of poverty, people are afraid of, you know, opening up the market for land, etc. These are not, we should not consider these topics as just propaganda and disinformation. We should work with, work with them, engage with citizens. Uh, and explain what is going on and, and try to, you know, to combat those fears. The fears and distrust is one of the key Ukrainian emotion. And it's understandably that these, uh, for example, pro Kremlin TV channels are abusing this so much. And the third issue is a very long term issue. I think it is important with, to work with this Ukrainian lack of agency. Uh, with the values, uh, with the with the the way how Ukrainians perceive themselves, because again, the key narrative is that Ukrainians, the a very big part of the society, uh, is not seeing the the center of agency within themselves, uh, and I would say this is a very long term strategy for you know years to come. I finish on this, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Volodymyr, and thank you again very much for reminding us, uh, I put it, uh, that our internal weaknesses become a weapon against us. And this is also thank you for reminding us how it is important to keep the unity inside of the country, to cherish uh, rule of law, anti-corruption, economic growth, and all of this to close all these gaps which can be used against us. So, uh, dear colleagues, thank you for presenting the Ukrainian uh, picture. Now we are moving to our colleagues from the Czech Republic. Veronika, now the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, as it was said, I work in uh, as an analyst in the specialized Kremlin Watch program uh, in the European Value Center for Security Policy. And uh, I want to mainly talk about uh, the, the massive, massive disinformation campaign, uh, which is taking place uh, right now as we speak uh, regarding the Verbetice case, uh, which David uh, uh, explained uh, at the beginning. Uh, because um, it's uh, really a very massive disinformation campaign, which uh, started to happening if, practically immediately after uh, the events uh, were uh, publicly announced for the first time uh, about three weeks ago. Um, and uh, this uh, strategy that Russian Federation is using uh, in this case is not different from uh, the strategy they used before. Uh, they used it in uh, 2014 after the annexation of Crimea or after shooting down the aircraft MH17. They used it also in 2018 uh, after uh, poisoning of the former Soviet agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Julia. They are denying everything. These official statements uh, of um, uh, Russian government officials are quite clear. They are not uh, willing to take any responsibility of, uh, for what uh, happened. And uh, this is not uh, what uh, only the uh, official Russian propaganda channels say, but it's uh, also the disinformation websites are repeating and saying as well, not only in the Czech Republic, but also in uh, other European Union member states and European partnership states. Uh, and um, this uh, meta narrative uh, is really just to deny everything what the officials uh, in the Czech Republic say, everything what the, uh, the intelligence services say, uh, and trying to blame it on someone else. Uh, and these reasons and these other uh, culprits from their point of view, this is what sort of crashes this meta narrative into separate narratives, uh, which, uh, which then describe uh, 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 different versions of what could have happened. Uh, 
And uh, of course, uh, the first uh, thing which has appeared on uh, on the, uh, the Czech disinformation websites and also in uh, the Russian official propaganda media uh, was that uh, the United States is somehow responsible for what happened in the Czech Republic, uh, that the Czech intelligence services are just, um, it's just a puppet of American CIA. Uh, but we have many different uh, other uh, disinformation narratives which are saying something uh, completely different. Uh, they are blaming different people, different groups of people, different states uh, for what happened, everyone except Russia. Uh, it's uh, obviously because uh, the main goal uh, that Russia wants to achieve is not to convince people that uh, Russia, what Russia says is true. They don't want to convince people that uh, the only truth is what Russian officials say. They just want to create as many versions as possible as possible of what could have happened so that the regular people are just too confused, too confused of what happened and uh, to, to the matter that they stop caring of what the truth is and stop looking for it, which I think uh, they are actually being quite successful in. And um, I must say that uh, this particular case is, uh, is actually very interesting because uh, Czech Republic unfortunately has some politicians who are actually helping uh, Russian propaganda to work this really well and successfully. Uh, first of all, we had uh, our prime minister, Andrei Babish, who at one of the press conferences said that it was not a, uh, an act of state terrorism and it was just an attack on uh, goods, uh, which he was very much criticized for saying because two citizens uh, uh, died during this uh, event and um, he basically said that they were goods. Um, so he was criticized and then he apologized for it. But the point is that once he said it, the information was out there and the damage has been done and uh, the information just lives on their own. And Russian propaganda immediately used it, not particularly the part about uh, and to, be, uh, to be in an attack on goods, but the first part saying that it was not uh, an act of state terrorism, because this is something what they wanted uh, someone would say out loud and the fact that the prime minister of the country actually said it was very helpful for them and uh, it appeared in Russian uh, media channels uh, right immediately he said it and also the disinformation media in the Czech Republic uh, repeated it. Uh, then of course we have our president um, Miloš Zeman uh, he is the biggest ally of the Kremlin in the Czech Republic. And uh, once again, in this case, he uh, sided with Russia. He, uh, it, it, it took a week for him to actually create a statement. And then he had this 10 minute long speech about it. Uh, during uh, these 10 minutes, uh, he repeated a few lies and a few disinformation narratives. Uh, two of them were uh, very uh, uh, like hard lies because uh, the first one was that he said that the Czech intelligence services didn't provide enough evidence uh, that these Russian agents were involved in this explosion. And uh, the second uh, lie was that uh, the police is um, operating with two investigative versions. This is both not truth. Uh, the prime minister, the minister of interior and, and interior and other high ranking politicians said it uh, many times out loud on different press conferences and under different uh, circumstances that there is only one version the police is working with and that's the version in which the Russian agents were involved and uh, that the Czech intelligence services provided enough evidence and, uh, and, and I personally think that uh, they must have, because I don't think that the, Rus that the Czech government would react as hard as expelling 18 Russian diplomats based on just suspicion. Um, so uh, I think that uh, President Miloš Zeman uh, did this speech really in favor uh, of Russian uh, Federation and Russian propaganda. And I think that they were really like really waiting for him to say it because 
uh, after he said that uh, the Czech intelligence services didn't provide enough evidence of uh, Russian involvement, uh, the uh, information agencies from Russia tweeted about it within a minute after he said it out loud. Uh, so, and then, and then we have uh, more uh, Czech politicians uh, in the government and in the parliament who repeat these very pro-Kremlin um, uh, narratives out loud. Uh, so I think that this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why our allies in uh, NATO and EU are very confused and why this um, international support is not uh, as strong as it was uh, in 2018 in, in the case of Great Britain, because uh, the what the government officials say it's not unified and uh, and even the people and our allies are just confused and don't know what kind of support we need what kind of support we actually want. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, and especially for reminding us another techniques which is used uh, that creation of variation of truth and attacking the truth as such in order to end, of course, uh, using internal divisions, internal weaknesses of the political um, environment, which unfortunately disables or minimize uh, the international support. Speaking of which, we are, we are moving to uh, Mrs. Ahonen to give us uh, the overview of, uh, because I know that the Stratcom has done a huge amount of work on monitoring, on uh, finding the way of con counteracting. Can you please share with us some of your recent uh, uh, fundings? Uh, Anneli, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olena. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here um, today. Uh, so I will speak from the point of view uh, of the head of East Stratcom Task Force, so focusing on information space, disinformation, and how to counter it. Uh, and I will not comment on the other general EU policy issues because uh, my job is, is to do Stratcom. Um, so I would like to go back a little bit uh, what David said um, in the beginning, in the very beginning, uh, about the, the wake up calls and, and how you really uh, like realize what is at stake uh, once you are yourself attacked. Uh, because I think that this has shown uh, on, on so many levels uh, in EU's response against disinformation. So our team was set up in 2015. Uh, with a mandate from the all, all of the EU member states uh, to address Russia's uh, disinformation. And this, of course, came from the background uh, of Russia's aggression uh, in Ukraine uh, and the legal annexation of Crimea. And then we had several uh, follow-up wake-up calls like Cambridge Analytica, uh, the Skripal poisoning, uh, all of which led into more calls for the EU to do more uh, to counter Russia disinformation, uh, but also uh, in more general uh, way. And the most recent one has been um, COVID-19, which also brought uh, China as a, as a player, uh, international uh, player, uh, spreading disinformation. <clears throat> so our um, approach uh, has been from the beginning uh, threefold. Uh, it is about communicating better uh, EU's policies in the Eastern Partnership countries and Russia. Uh, it is to support independent media and work together uh, with the civil society actors um, and then to counter disinformation uh, where we run the EU versus disinfo uh, campaign to raise awareness about, um, about pro Kremlin disinformation. And I think that one of the essential things that have been um, part of this like awareness uh, in Brussels and in the EU level has also been the voices uh, that are here today in this panel, uh, like uh, European values uh, and all the Ukrainian partners. It has been completely essential uh, in explaining uh, what is happening uh, and what Russia is, is doing. Um, and now for the, for the most recent uh, case studies, as outlined in this discussion, uh, I can just uh, agree with the analysis and, and, it's, and share the, the views that have been presented. Uh, and our coverage on EU versus this info is, is very similar. Maybe, maybe something to add on the, on the Czech case is that also 
of course, every time when the tensions internally grow in, inside Russia, uh, that shows in in uh, in disinformation uh, campaigns as well. So, for example, one of the uh, one of the cases uh, was the claim that uh, Russian and Belarusian secret services have revealed uh, a coup attempt on Lukashenko, and now uh, the Czech uh, officials and politicians are trying to uh, uh, distract the attention from this. Uh, from this coup attempt. So, th so this is like quite, um, you know, developed uh, ways to, uh, to, to manipulate the, the, especially the domestic Russian audiences with, the, with these type of, type of stories. Um, we have been strengthening our work, uh, especially in the Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, we soon start translating uh, our, our content um, into all of the Eastern Partnership languages. Uh, and most recently, uh, we have been working uh, together with the EU delegations and other EU partners um, on especially aware, raising awareness about uh, COVID-19 and anti-vax disinformation, how to talk to an anti-vaxxer um, and have been uh, running a campaign interviewing uh, journalists who are countering disinformation and bringing their voices to, to European audiences. Uh, so, so this type of uh, more developed, uh, more targeted uh, communication is, is one, of the, one of the future directions. And it's also based on the current research that the more voices you have together is strengthening, uh, debunking and strengthening the, the factual narratives, uh, the, the more effective uh, the, the results are among the audiences, going back to the issue of, of fixing the, the internal, uh, internal issues that, that all of our, uh, our, our countries have. Uh, but I would like to uh, conclude here, uh, and then I'm happy to answer to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Aoun, and uh, for reminding us of important uh, work of the ISTRAT of, uh, is uh, doing right now on this disinformation uh, uh, area. And uh, yes, hopefully there will be more questions to you. And uh, um, as we uh, promised, we have time for discussion and we have, uh, uh, we see two questions in the Q&A. And one is addressed to David directly on uh, this uh, famous uh, eternal question, whether you debunk, as we no uh, now call it, uh, Kremlin uh, and uh, citizens of Russia, or we take them as uh, uh, complementary, uh, let's say community, let's put it this way. And uh, another question is on Belarus. Uh, and I would propose uh, to touch, yes, I see uh, Volodymyr, you want to touch, I would like to propose to tackle the issue of Belarus in the context of using, uh, let's say, Belarus um, kind of not case, but Belarus in the context of uh, Russian aggression towards other uh, countries to narrow a little bit this angle and to make it more complementary to our event today. And I also please, uh, because we have kind of uh, more more time, please, those of you who have already uh, other questions, please uh, don't hesitate to edit and hopefully we will uh, handle it as well. So David, I think I will give the floor to you first and then to Vladimir to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that uh, question from Taras Kujo. Uh, actually, I'm not so naive to believe that uh, there is a major difference between what the average Russian citizen think and what the official Russian authorities are doing. I, I, I am perfectly aware that there is this kind of a collective state of mind of a collective Putin. So the, the majority of the society is uh, blindly following and supporting what their leader is actually saying. It very much resembles the fascist Germany before the Second World War. The latest speech of Putin at the Red Square during the military parade was a wonderful illustration of that, that he is preparing the society for a possible major assault from abroad. And we see his kind of a psychological preparations of his compatriots uh, to defend their motherland, which is quite scary. So uh, maybe I haven't expressed myself so clearly I wish to believe that there should be a difference between the Russian, uh, let's say, society population and the leaders. 
uh, somehow there is a little hope in your question because you write that there are 85% of Russians who do support that. So the remaining 15% might be of a different opinion. And why I'm saying that, because uh, I've been doing a research on the Russian minority and diaspora in the, here in the Czech Republic last year. And I was frankly speaking uh, amazed, positively amazed how uh, heterogeneous, uh, how different uh, that uh, Russian diaspora in our country is. In general, they are perceived as a fifth column of Putin's regime, but there are many groups among them uh, who are also kind of a victims of Putin's regime. There are the people, especially the young people, who do not agree with what their state is doing uh, abroad. I even heard from a couple of them like uh, asking for an excuse for all what the things that the uh, Russian Federation is doing globally. Uh, and, so, and, not, and, and then it came as a no surprise when there was, these, there was this kind of a so-called referendum in Russia about the constitutional amendments. And here in the Czech Republic, in two out of three uh, electoral districts, the, the people rejected uh, these amendments. And they were mainly young people, Russian citizens, who rejected uh, this eternal uh, ruling of Putin. So this is a kind of a hope. And why I started to make this difference, because during the last crisis was the Russian Geru officers committing that uh, uh, act of uh, terrorism here on our territory. Uh, several Russian friends of mine kind of asked me and, and even they mentioned it on Facebook and social media, uh, ask for differentiating between them and the uh, Russian state. And uh, not surprisingly, the representative of Russian minority spoke at the large demonstration against President Zeman. And uh, that lady officially condemned both Zeman and the fact that the Russian state is committing these acts abroad. So uh, this is kind of a reason why I'm trying to make this distinction, knowing that uh, most of the Russians back in Russian Federation are completely brainwashed. They are like zombies and they do consume that propaganda from Russian media. But just let's, let us imagine that suddenly that Russian propaganda is gone and the same Russian TV channels are suddenly broadcasting completely different messages. I, I would say that most of the Russians would be completely confused, but uh, hopefully they haven't lost the rest of their critical thinking and then uh, they are kind of not lost uh, cases and that this kind of a collective Putin could be somehow squeezed out from their minds. Thank you. Uh, Taras uh, is, ent is uh, entering more data about mm. this um, un unfortunately attacking your hope <laughs> on uh, disconnection between people and uh, uh, the Kremlin. That's but a, I, I also maybe... Last, uh, last sentence yeah, yeah. Uh, about uh, Alexei Navalny. This is something that we, were, that we have been telling here to the Czech politicians, to uh, different Czech experts, that uh, Navalny's opinions also like Khodorkovsky, uh, don't differ too much uh, from the Russian state propaganda on this on such issues like uh, Crimea. I mean, we are our center is always kind of promoting this kind of a sentence that uh, Russian democracy ends there where the Ukraine national question starts. Yeah, I would wonder if any Ukrainian uh, colleague would like to say anything about uh, what is our vision about this. Um, is there any hope or not? Is there unity or there's still some gaps between the Kremlin and the people? But first, we uh, I give the floor to Volodymyr, right? To I can, I can Belarus. follow up. And I also, follow. please feel free to follow up, follow up on, uh, on this question. issue. Yes, because it's... Uh, well, obviously, I think in, uh, Ukrainians are much more skeptical generally to Russian even opposition than uh, some Western liberal cir circles. It's it's obvious why. And uh, I recently wrote an article uh, for Nova Vreme analyzing different stages of Russian so-called Westernism and uh, showing that Russian Westernization from Peter the Great through Bolsheviks uh, led historically to even even more uh, uh, more horrible totalitarianism, more authoritarianism. So we are very skeptical about you know uh, Russian opposition, and um, 
On the, on, the, on the other hand, I think in another extreme is to identify all the Russians with the Kremlin. This is something that, that David was fighting against. And I, I, I'm totally agree with this, but I, I would also be skeptical about this thought that, you know, 85% oh, of Russians are just manipul manipulated and uh, zombies. I think this is kind of an internal political culture, Russian political culture, which doesn't see itself as a parts of citizens as a part of nation state, but rather citizens of an empire. And the empire keeps extending. That's what uh, Russian theory, uh, theoreticians of the Russian imperialism, like Mr. Dugin or others, uh, are saying. Empire cannot just be stable within these borders. Empire is something that uh, is expanding all the time. This is what is dangerous. Now to the Belarus question. Um, uh, we have a very interesting joint project with the European Values Think Tank, with uh, David and with Veronica and Internews Ukraine, which is called Belarus Watch. Uh, and I really advise you to look at it. We just published a, uh, I think, fourth issue. And tomorrow we'll be holding a public presentation. So look up at our websites, European Values and Ukraine Watch, we have, or Ukraine World. We have um, very interesting and very good Belarusian experts who are analyzing the Russian influences in Belarus in a very good English language, so check it up. What I can say is that, of course, after these protests, after, after these you know, big protests and big uh, crackdown of these protests, by Lukashenko regime, I think Lukashenko has lost whatsoever his kind of a position of a mediator between Kiev and Moscow. So uh, we're still talking about in terms of Minsk agreements, and let me remind that Minsk agreements have been able to be to be concluded in Minsk because of this kind of the illusion that Lukashenko can serve as a kind of a intermediary. I think he lost his status right now, and uh, that what we could follow from his Lukashenko's recent visit to Moscow when he was acting as a subordinate, as a clear subordinate of Mr. Putin, as a kind of a part of his cabinet or something like that. Therefore, Ukrainians are very scared that uh, Belarus, Belarus can be a second front. That's something that you always can hear from Ukrainian uh, you know, foreign ministry, defense ministry. Even today, as we are talking, a Ukrainian defense minister uh, said that he, he does not exclude possible using the Belarus land as a kind of a you know, northern front. And let me remind that now Ukraine is, if the northern front is a, is, a, is a threat, Ukraine will be just surrounded from the north, from the east, and from the south, from Crimea. Therefore, of course, we are looking at it with, uh, with very, you know, with a kind of a very, very big concern. And um, uh, the question is what the West, what the leverage the West can have uh, about Belarus. Belar Belarusian economics is not Ukrainian economics. Ukrainian economics, even during Yanukovych time, was uh, oriented even more to the EU than to Russia, or half 50-50. Uh, now it's just EU vector totally prevails. In the Belarusian economy, the Russian vector totally prevails. I think the key thing that the West should be thinking is not in terms of sanctions, there was, uh, there was a question about sanctions, it's quite a dubious mechanism, but in terms of, you know, long-term strategy of people-to-people -people contacts, because we see Ukraine has a, what, what makes Ukraine different from Russia and Belarus is that Every five years, except for Kuchma, 10 years time, every five years we have the change of the elites. Change of political elites bring the change of the other, other level of the elites, you know, social mobility, etc. This is not what's happening in Belarus and, and Russia. Therefore, there is growing alienation between the society and the way how it thinks and, and, the, and the leadership. And I think, I hope, this is my hope, that one day we will see first Belarus and maybe in some several centuries Russia, <laughs> or maybe several decades, the same process that are, that are going on uh, as, as in Ukraine. That would be my response. Thank you, Volodymyr. I can only join you in this hope. And also, I'm very happy to hear about this uh, more and more examples of uh, transferring Ukrainian experience to our Belarus colleagues. And maybe this is also one of the elements uh, which we need to nourish uh, in order to prevent uh, Belarus of active participation in uh, if if a big aggression will happen. And uh, as we predicted, we'd say, <laughs> we have a separate question to Anneli and uh, she read it. So I will not repeat the question. Uh, I give the floor directly to Anneli to answer this. 
Thank you. So the, so the question was um, about the spread of uh, Russia's disinformation on the, uh, on the uh, Czech um, explosion and, and attack. Um, uh, I think that like, you know, in this case, we are talking about a disinformation campaign that runs centrally from, from the Kremlin and from the like official uh, Russian sources. It is it is very similar to to the campaigns around uh, skeptical poisoning uh, or MH17 uh, in this case. So then um, the disinformation usually also spreads across all the all the Russian outlets that we monitor in in different languages. Uh, so we have seen uh, these messages repeated in Spanish and in Arabic and uh, uh, in the Baltics and in Polish. Um, so, so this is very um, clear that the, the attempt to, to spread this information in as many languages as possible uh, is there. Uh, how much these are picked up by the domestic audiences and different uh, like disinformation uh, groupings, for example, on, on social media. Um, uh, right now, I don't have this uh, information and the, the domestic side of things is, is beyond our mandate. Uh, but I can share the, the link to our findings in the, in the chat. So there you can, uh, you can also check the, the, the spread uh, more clearly yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, we are pretty much very punctual this uh, time and I thank everyone for very uh, active uh, participation, including to the audience. So as we uh, said that uh, we expected good questions and we received very good questions and we thank uh, the participants for them. And what I can say, I will also give the floor to our co-organizers. From my side, I would say only one thing. Let's not wait any other new escalation to unite our forces and to keep our unity and to learn from each other and to transfer the best knowledges and uh, to keep our solidarity in these times. So on behalf of the Ukrainian think tank, Liaison Office, once again, let me thank you for participation. I want to thank our co-organizers uh, and our supporters. And I uh, also um, invite you to uh, those who did not yet subscribe to the digest to know all about latest analysis about Ukraine and on the upcoming events. And I want to see uh, all of you and our next uh, events. And I give now the free floor to co-organizers to say their words from their organizations. So please just take your floor. And of course, wait, 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 it's important. We want to thank our communication teams who have done a great job in order to make this uh, webinar uh, possible. Dmitro, Jana, people from um, European Values as well, into news and text. Anyone who wants to add? Frankly speaking, I have nothing to add. So thank you, Olena, for organizing it. And it was great to see colleagues here still online, but hopefully soon also offline. Okay, excellent. It was very nice uh, to see everyone. Please also take a note uh, on the, uh, on the um, web page, which uh, Nelly has sent in the chat. Uh, and uh, we keep in touch and we keep active and of course and first of all we keep safe and healthy see you all bye bye